on abide, abiding, learning how to abide, and uh, there's no way to cleanly divide all the elements of abiding. In fact, this morning there's words in here that are a number of words that we will look into deeper in the series itself. Um, and as I read those words, I'll mention them. Um, but uh, we know this first verse of Hebrews 11, but we oftentimes ignore kind of what leads up to that verse in the few verses. And I could have gone back a little farther in chapter 10. Um, but we see a confident trust in God or in the Lord is one of the definitions. And, and believing that He will do as He promised. Yes. Not always what we want, but what we need. Kind of like a heavenly parent saying, I, I know, I heard you. I know that you want this. And you will get some of the things you want, but the things that you need are the first. Um, and, and we'll get to the whole word abide, too. It's not one that we use very often anymore, unfortunately. Um, I believe, um, and maybe this is just as I'm getting older, I believe there's things worth dusting off and bringing back into our lives and the term and the, the thought behind the term of abide is one of those things. Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 35. Do not throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it gives you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay, and my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Now, does that mean we don't make mistakes? No. Um, in fact, we're reminded that um, we are here for each other, too. Um, sometimes it's a gentle word and an uh, arm around the shoulder. Sometimes it's a kick in the backside. Um, in love, of course. <laughs> um, and then chapter 11, verse 1 and 6. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And then verse 6, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that he, God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. This ends a reading of God's holy and inspired Word. Thanks be to God. Now that verse 6 sounds like it's painf painfully obvious, but longtime Christians, new Christians, we all need to be reminded of that. Um, let's... Let's pray for a moment here. Oh God, we know that we live in a world where we as Christians desperately need to learn and relearn and reapply what it means to abide in you. There's so much about abiding in you that is counter-cultural. I hope and pray now, Lord, as we look at this, uh, this topic, this loving invitation that you give to us, that we would set our hearts on you in such a way that maybe some of the things that we're accustomed to may fall away for the glory of your name and for the advancement of your kingdom as we seek to live more and more into the invitation you've given each of us and all of us together. Amen. I mentioned this a little bit in our last Wednesday's Bible study. Living as a spiritually, mentally, and emotionally healthy follower of Jesus Christ in our technologically calendar-driven culture is, it turns out, quite difficult. Pastor and author John Ortberg relays some valuable wisdom that he received from his late mentor, Dallas Willard. And by, by the way, um, I just restarted a, a relationship with a man who swore he wasn't going to become a pastor. He's down in Florida now, but he's calling me 
and he's looking at possibly starting a ministry in Grand Rapids. Um, and I, had, I remember this. It happened uh, seven, eight years ago. He was at his wit's end, and he stopped in the church I was serving. And he had a mental note, and he kept my phone number. And he said, I want that guy to be my mentor. And now God's called him into ministry. And the reason he was uh, hesitant was because his father was an internationally renowned uh, evangelist and pastor. And there was so much about his father that turned him off. But now, it, and everybody in the community expected him. He's living in Florida, but he's looking to do ministry in Florida. And here he's already doing ministry in his business startups because a lot of the people he hires are not hireable. And so um, I, I have to learn to be good at being 60 years old and being around long enough that people are going to start making those kinds of phone calls. Would, would you pray for me on that too? Because he kind of got after me recently and said, in the next two weeks, your, your assignment, my mentor, is to come up with a, a day of each month that we can meet together. Um, and I'm not good at that. Um, I, whatever's in front of me, whatever is urgent in front of me, I tend to grab at that. And as you know, if you've done ministry, which you have, uh, it, it's easy to get sidelined. Dallas Willard, though, the reason I brought that up was he said, give me some names of people that you think um, are timeless and have valuable wisdom. And Dallas Willard is one of those authors um, that I'm going to give to him because I can pull a Dallas Willard bo book off of my shelf and it, it applies today just like it did when he wrote it 20 or 30 years ago. It's kind of like, I, I'm not going to compare it to the Bible, but the Bible has that quality too, right? We think we're coming up with new ways of, of loopholing and getting around God in the Bible. Confronts all those loopholes, right? This is what uh, Dallas Willard said to John Ortberg. Hurry involves excessive haste and a false sense of urgency. I, uh, a few years ago, I preached a sermon on what's important and what's urgent. And one of the elders of that church came up to me and said, you had everything all backwards. He said, we tend to, we tend to go to the things that are urgent and then we miss what, are, what is important. And I said, no. Important are the things we get all mixed up. Because something might be really important to me, but it's not important to somebody else. Um, but when something's urgent, we, we all tend to rush to help, right? So I had a little, it wasn't a, quite a come to Jesus moment, but we just agreed to disagree. But I said, from my ministry standpoint, when it's, and I said, it's not just ministry. Um, if you go to a cardiologist and he says, you know, you're changing your diet is, uh, is important and maybe getting a little exercise. And so now, if there are any donuts left, I'll just put one on, on a string and I'll, and I'll run, start running after that donut, right? Did you guys leave me a donut? No? <laughs> um, but if, if I'm having a heart attack, I'm not going to go to the doctor's office and, while I'm having a heart attack. Um, what, do they, what do they call that down at the hospital? You go to emergency or urgent Urgent care emergency, right? It's urgent. We got to intervene right now. Hurry involves excessive haste and a false sense of urgency, right? It is associated with words like, now listen to this. This is kind of the etymology, the, the origins of the word, and, and other words in English that sound like it that are related. Hurl, <laughs> hurdle. Hurly burly, which is an old way of saying uproar. Hurricane. Hurry is a state of frantic effort. One falls into response to inadequacy, fear, and guilt. Right? Hurry feeds the insatiable hunger of anxiety and worry that eats us from the inside out. The simple essence of hurry is too much to do in too little time. Right? Doesn't matter if you're out 
working on the streets uh, or working building homes or if you're working in the office, if you're driving and doing deliveries, there are more deliveries on your plate than there were years ago. If you're in the cubicle in the office, the person that on your left and to your right are no longer there and now you're doing their work as well as your own, right? The good of being delivered from hurry is not simply pleasure, but healthy balance, that is, the ability to do calmly and effectively with strength and joy that which really matters. By the way, yesterday a woman came up to me. Um, I was playing music with another person um, up at a camp on Crystal Lake in Frankfurt, and a woman came up to me and said, are you and your wife staying here this uh, week this summer? And I said, we are. What week are you staying here? And I thought, oh, where is this going? And uh, the cabin is right next to the chapel. She said, we have an opening that Sunday. I'd like you to preach that Sunday. Now I looked at her and I said, um, I appreciate the invitation, but I have not had a Sunday off since August 13 of 2023. And she goes, disregard that invitation. <laughs> See, I wasn't strong enough to just say, no. <laughs> I still kind of want to do it, but I don't want to do it. In fact, we need to vacate the cabin when the uh, chapel is going on. It is a little uncomfortable when you're a pastor, you're worn out and you're sitting in a cabin and there's a chapel right next door and they can look right into the cabin. <laughs> you think you're the only ones that have that feeling, right? At the end of Dallas Willard's words to John Orberg, and I'm so glad that John wrote them down because they're not, I don't think they're in his books, uh, Dallas Willard's books. We should form a clear intention to live without hurry. And it's not just always being in a hurry, but it's all the work leading to do something, like me preaching in a chapel service when I'm not here and, and I'm supposed to be on vacation, right? Um... I, I could just reuse something that maybe I preached here recently, but that's not really the issue. It's just kind of that heart that says, oh, I got to make everybody happy all the time, right? And he ended saying this, Dallas Willard to John Hortberg, one day at a time. Yeah. Trying today. Now, I don't, I'm not quite certain but maybe just, let's just start with today. I mean, when I pulled in this morning, I had some of the thoughts and maybe you had the, oh, that's right, they're redoing our parking lot this week, you know. And I was kind of glad that big machine is in the corner because it was a physical reminder for a guy who forgets a lot of things. Oh yeah, don't park your car, otherwise it, you might just see the top of it. <laughs> no, they would ask me to move it. There is a reason, there is a reason we see the word abide in only the more traditional translations of the Bible. Even, I think the NIV uses the word remain. Um, that's a popular replacement. Uh, to stay put. Um, but there's also movement and abiding too. It's going, but it's remaining. So it's kind of this paradox. Um, but we don't see that word abide in too many of the newer translations. I believe the ESV, the English Standard Version, uses abide, kind of tipping its hat to the old traditional word. But many of our new translations and versions of Scripture do not use the word abide. The word itself is falling out of much of modern usage, largely because the concept of living into God's generous providing has unfortunately fallen by the wayside in our highly technologically produced world. Now, have you ever thought of this? Wouldn't you think that automation in the workplace and in our day-to-day -day lives would help us celebrate a much more highly productive day than our foreparents? Giving us more valuable time in our day to focus on abiding in Christ. But instead, much more is demanded of us and if we're not honest, many times we fall into the trap of expecting and heaping unrealistic demands 
upon ourselves. Can we admit that sometimes we're part of the problem? Yes. Can we do that? I'm making a confession as I bring that up, by the way. Sometimes I can be my worst enemy. And I know that I'm not the only one holding up a mirror here, right? Sometimes we can be our worst enemy. And if we're not careful, we may be reduced to a broken heart, a broken will and spirit. Let's be honest, a puddle of tears. To abide is to dwell or live into, to remain, to be present, to be held, to be kept. And part of the reason we have a hard time abiding is because most of the time we're already thinking about what we're going to do next. And we're missing the essence of the present moment. God alone gives us faith to live into the present moment. The present moment of the faith-filled Christ follower is always, always tied to the ambition of seeking God's kingdom above everything else. That is why Jesus invites us to take a deep breath, put our cell phone away, unless, of course, you're looking up Bible Gateway. But even then, I would recommend just use a Bible. Let our hearts slow down and let God take care of the world. When He says to us, your heavenly Father already knows your needs. This is Jesus to His disciples. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, righteously, and He will give you everything you need. And then this one smacks me right in the forehead. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That's on my top ten list of things that Jesus said, by the way. It might even be number one. Can you tell what I have a trouble with sometimes? Today's trouble's enough for today. Don't get all worked up about tomorrow morning or what's happening Wednesday afternoon or what you're planning on Friday or Saturday of next weekend. The Apostle Paul follows Jesus teaching and adds his Spirit-inspired word on how replacing worry with prayer, that is learning to sincerely abide, shapes our faith foundation. Now, you know this passage but can I invite you uh, along with me to live more and more into it to, as we abide in Christ? Don't worry about anything. By the way, there's, there's an invisible parenthesis after don't worry about anything. Um, if we stop right there, I have an invisible parenth parenthetical note. It says, yeah, right. Do you know that feeling? It's, by the way, it's not disrespectful. It's, it's okay to struggle with Scripture. It's a part of our wrestling with God. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Right? So what is Paul? He, he's got this thing going on in his mind. You think Paul has a problem with worry? I do believe he does. He talks about it a lot. So how does Paul pray? Well, okay, God, I'm making this deal with you. Every time that worry comes to the surface... I'm going to start praying. Amen. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. There's another thing. Prayer helps us fight off, fend off worry and anxiety. But also, when we pray and we talk to God, it reminds us of what God has already done. And when we start thinking about that, we raise up the temperature of our gratitude. A lot of our worry is because we forget to be thankful. Right? We're always moving on to the next thing. Right? It's in our nature. But if we keep doing that all the time, that is not spiritually or emotionally healthy for us. Thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus, as you abide. God will give us all the trimmings for abiding, all the things that we need, including the peace that will settle our hearts. 
All the times we look down at our hearts or we think in our mind, just stop it, stop it. Stop dwelling on the stuff that you have no control, that I have no control over. If faith is a trusting confidence that what we hope for in light of God's coming kingdom is actually going to happen, then we should be more naturally gravitating towards abiding in the presence of God. A God who tells us all through His Word, I've got it covered. And He goes beyond that. I've got you covered. If abiding in Jesus Christ is desperately something we need to pay more attention to and seek more intentionally to live into, growing in our intimacy with God and with one another. If we pay attention to the way of abiding because it's important to God and God reminds us that it is very important to Him as we wait for the greater things that the author of Hebrew writes, then we know those things will last forever. Those greater things that will last forever. That we see those words in that promise in Hebrews 10. Then we cannot entrust ourselves. Can we not entrust ourselves? This is a question to Hebrews 10, 35-36. Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now. The old word is long-suffering so that you will continue to do God's will, then you will receive all that He has promised. That's part of the definition. In fact, the author revisits that in our verse 1 of chapter 11, the one, that verse that we often go to to define faith. When we faithfully abide in Christ, Jesus teaches us how to transform struggle into strength. Think about that. Jesus teaches us how to transform struggle into strength. He can make good on struggle. Now, how many of us would raise our hand and vote for struggle? No. That's part of the reason we're looking forward to eternity, right? But we do know on this side of eternity, struggle can be used to transform our faith and transform it into strength. That is how the Apostle Paul can confess with godly confidence. And by the way, we have no idea. It may have been a physical ailment. It was something that got in the way in Paul's effectiveness in ministry. But Paul states in 2 Corinthians 12, three different times I begged the Lord to take my struggles away. Each time he said, nope. (laughs) No, God didn't say nope. He said, My grace is all you need. My grace is sufficient. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the insults, the hardships, the persecution, and the trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong, right? That makes no sense. But it does. It makes all kinds of sense. When you go below the surface, right? It's when we go below the surface, we know that God is making us strong when we appear weak, right? It's in our weaknesses. It's in our relying on God's strength. It's being thankful. It's accepting God's gift of peace. I suspect that our abiding in Christ may be challenging to us because we like to be self-sufficient. Here's another area where we're countercultural as Christ followers in this world of ours. And yet, it's precisely because we desperately need Jesus that we may seriously want to take Him up on His invitation to remain fixed in Him as we both endure and overcome distractions and temptations with His help. Sometimes that involves one another, the one another's, each of us helping each other, seeing in a weakness not an opportunity to pounce on a brother or sister, but to say, I want to help you. I see your feet are in the muck and the mire, and I want to help pull you out. Will you let me help you in love? 
It's not a judgment. It's just recognizing where a person is. And let's be honest. We often can see where someone is because we've been there. Right? And by the way, if you're stuck in the mire, God will give you the strength to help somebody else out of the mire. The last I checked, that's really hard to do on our own. I do know something about being stuck in the mire. While I was in seminary, I built seawall on Lake Michigan. And we worked in places, we built seawalls, and we worked in places where we couldn't get, sometimes they would bring in a crane um, from a barge on the lake. But a lot of times we had to do everything by hand. And um, we were the guys that uh, the customer uh, hired when the other companies wouldn't do it because all their fancy equipment couldn't, couldn't get into the space. But having said that, we would dig down usually four to six feet of sand. Do you know how hard it is to keep sand? It just keeps coming when you dig. And you make forms and then you keep it out. But then below the sand is gray, the grayest clay that you'll see in all of North America is below the sand along the lake and even farther inland. Farmers know this because they have to deal with clay all the time. Clay can be your friend when you're growing kinds of, certain kinds of crops. Um, but it also can be your enemy, especially when we get way too much rain, then the water just sits there. Um, but here's something about clay. If you're working away at one spot for a long time and you're wearing hip boots, it doesn't matter what kind of boots you're wearing, probably shouldn't wear low ride boots because I know this from experience too. When, when the guys pull you out, the boots remain and you're standing there in your socks. <clears throat> It's no fun. And then you have to take a pick and pick around the boot to pull the boot out and then chop all the, the clay off the boot. That's a picture of the mess we get in sometimes in life, right? And I've actually been on a job site for where I got stuck and nobody was around. That gets really interesting. The difference with having a crew around is when nobody's around, you end up um, covered with clay and water by the time you get out of the pit because you managed to get your feet out of the boots but then you had to fall over and struggle and try to grab for a branch or something that you could pull yourself out of the boots and you fall and you roll and uh, the crew comes back and says what happened here and they know what happened right we need each other right you stand in one place too, for too long but we can help each other through the muck and the mire. God gives us all that we need. Amen. And he give, part of what he gives us is each other. This is, this is a humbling process. I believe it's intentionally humbling. Not because God wants to put us down, but because he wants to make us strong through our weakness. He wants to bring strength through our struggle. When we accept God's invitation to abide, it reminds us of our need of a foundation of faith. Believing that God exists and rewarding us when we humbly seek Him and learn from Him to faithfully abide in Him. Growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ and with each other. Characterized by trust, prayer, obedience, and joy. Will you faithfully join me this summer as we seek to approach abiding in Christ Jesus from many angles for the benefit of each of us and for all of us together? Will you? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, take our everyday, ordinary life, our sleeping, our eating, going to work, walking around life, and find us placing it before you as an offering, letting every detail of our lives, our words, our actions, everything that we are, everything you've created us to be, everything we do out of the holiness you've placed in us, may it all be done in your name, Master, Redeemer, Savior, and Friend, thanking God the Father every step of the way. 
as we let you lead us. Amen.